um, among other things. Anyway, I think we should get started. So it's three minutes past the hour uh, and we'll get a little bit more into detail in a few minutes. So welcome to the webinar hosted by Catholic Investment Services. Thank you for joining us for another Mission in Focus webinar. For over 800 years, the Franciscan friars have been entrusted by the Holy See with preservation of the great shrines of the Latin church in the Middle East, serving both pilgrims to the Holy Land and local Christian communities. Today, we will explore the work of the custody and the unique challenges it now faces in the Middle East, as well as the critical supporting role that the custody's international presence plays, including the Franciscan Monastery of the Holy Land in Washington, DC that we've been just talking about. In a few minutes, I'm gonna share a few pictures so you can get an idea of how beautiful this place is. Um, my name is Zela Estarjan, and I'm Managing Director of Catholic Investment Services. Enormous thanks to our accomplished panelists who you will meet shortly. Today's format will be conversational and there's gonna be time for audience questions during and after the formal part of the program. So please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen to submit a question. Our audience is muted and the program is being recorded and will be available for replay on our CIS Institute webpage, as well as in podcast format. And our podcast series is called Sustainable Grace. Catholic Investment Services was founded by some of the investment industry's most respected leaders to address the investment challenges faced by Catholic organizations. We're a Catholic nonprofit providing investment solutions for other Catholic nonprofits and their investment consultants, and now manage over 1 billion of client assets in four different strategies. You received biographical information for our speakers, but I wanna emphasize a few highlights. And um, he, here's a little bit of everybody's picture. So Paul Stevens is a trustee of Catholic Investment Services and chairs our board's audit committee. Just as importantly, Paul served for many years as the investment committee chair for the Diocese of Arlington in Virginia and continues to serve as a fiduciary for several other Catholic organizations, including Catholic Distance University and Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington. Before his distinguished career as CEO of the Investment Company Institute and in private law practice, Paul served in senior positions at the White House and Department of Defense during the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations and received the Department of Defense's highest civilian honor. So today, happy, Paul is gonna be happy to answer any geopolitical questions that you may have. Um, so Father David Watson began his initial formation as a Franciscan at the Franciscan Monastery in Washington, D.C. Following solemn vows, he continued his studies at Catholic University of America. In September of 1989, he was sent on a mission to the Holy Land and was assigned to the friary in Bethlehem next to the Nativity Basilica while preparing for ministry as a guide for pilgrims. After five years of service as a guide, he returned to Washington to begin theological studies. And then he was ordained to the priesthood in the monastery church. He was later assigned to promote pilgrimages to the Holy Land in 2007. As director of the pilgrimage office, he has brought several thousand pilgrims to the Holy Land, leading many of the pilgrimages as both guide and chaplain. Presently, Father Watson serves as guardian of the local Franciscan community, and he hopes to be returning to serve in the pilgrimage ministry in the not too distant future. Father David Granier, originally from Canada, joined the Franciscans of the Holy Land in 2007. After completing his study for priesthood, he was appointed as director of the Magnificat Music School, located in the old city of Jerusalem, that brings together through music, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. For three years, starting in 2016, he was secretary of the Holy Land, helping the Custos of the Holy Land, supervising the different activities that the Franciscans have in the region. Father David was then transferred in 2019 to the Commissariat of the Holy Land in Washington, DC, 
where he is now commissary of the Holy Land, vicar for the Franciscan community, vocational animator for the US and Canada, and publisher of the Holy Land Review. He's a very busy man. Um, before we officially begin our program, please join us in a short prayer. Father Watham. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. <clears throat> to be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Zella, thank you very much for launching us this way. And, and we've got a lot, lot of ground to cover. I just want to say what a privilege it is for me to be with these two wonderful Franciscans. Um, uh, it's uh, been my, my honor to be a, a part, small part of the life of the monastery for almost uh, 15 years now. But I'm not sure that even very well-informed Catholics understand as much as they should about the history and mission of the custody of the Holy Land. So I want to start with that. We, we all kind of know, um, maybe in the back of our minds, the wonderful story of St. Francis in 20, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, what is it, uh, 1219, I believe, oh, thing, yes. deciding that he was going to take off with some of uh, the most distinguished members of your order and, and head, to, head to the Holy Land, to, the, to the, where the Crusaders were. Uh, and he uh, made it through the lines and spent some time with the Sultan uh, and then made it back with his head intact, which was the miraculous part perhaps. But that seems to have launched the Order of Friars Minor into a very special role on behalf of our church in the Middle East. Um, Father Grenier, maybe you could talk a little bit about that history and how it came about. Yeah, San Francisco, in the time in which everyone thought that Muslims and Christians should kill one another, decided that, okay, instead of using the weapons of uh, war, the weapons of uh, shields and, and, and swords, it was better to um, use the weapons of faith, peace, and dialogue. And so he met with the Sultan. And the Sultan allowed him and all his followers to stay in, um, in the holy places. So it, it all starts 800 years ago. Um, he could have lost his life, as you said, but finally the Sultan instead gave him a, a safe conduct to allow the, the, Christ, the, the Franciscans to be in the holy places. And for 400 years, the Franciscans were the only Catholics in the Holy Land. So in front of that fact, Pope Clement VI in 1342 gave us the responsibility of taking care of the holy shrines of Christianity in the name of the Catholic Church. So uh, the Franciscans established themselves at the Holy Sepulcher, where there's Calvary and the tomb of Christ, where uh, in Bethlehem for the, the, the Church of the Nativity at the tomb of the Virgin Mary, um, and in, uh, at the Last Supper Room also. And over there, they were welcoming all the pilgrims that were coming. At the time, I mean, the pilgrims were not very numerous. I know that in the 16th century in 1521, uh, we recorded 16 pilgrims during the year. So that was not so much, um, but still the friars were there and the Pope asked them for three things. The first thing is that the friars that would be there would be good friars. So we try to do our best. We try to be good. Uh, second thing is that they would come from all over the world to welcome the pilgrims that come from all over the world. So today in the Holy Land, we have uh, Franciscan friars coming from 61 different countries serving in the Holy Land. Uh, when I was living over there, I lived with people from China, from Australia, from Congo, from Brazil, from Argentina, from all over the place, all over the world. And then the third thing that he asked is that we would make sure that these places are places of prayer. 
So even now that there's very few pilgrims going to the Holy Land, uh, and with the pandemic for two years, no one uh, absolutely uh, went to the Holy Land because the borders were even closed by the state of Israel. Uh, the friars were there praying for the people, praying for the, the world, for the healing of the, from the pandemic, uh, and continuing to celebrate uh, the mysteries of Christ in the places where it took place. So that's our main responsibility over there. We are responsible of around 80 shrines. You can think about all the major cities that you read in the Bible, and we are over there, in Nazareth, and Jerusalem, and Bethlehem, and Jericho, Cana, Capernaum. But we have also the shrines that are linked with the Bible that uh, are not uh, necessarily linked with the gospel. For example, we have a shrine in Jordan, and Mount Nebo, where uh, Moses uh, finished his life when he looked at the promised land uh, before dying. We have a sanctuary in uh, Damascus for the conversion of St. Paul. And so that's something that we do. We're trying to take care of these uh, shrines and make sure that the, all the Christians that come to the Holy Land can go there and pray in the places where uh, Jesus did so much out of love for us. And yeah, I feel 80, that- 80 shrines in, in how many countries, Father? Actually, what we call the custody of the Holy Land is divided in 11 countries. So I include in that Washington where we are. We have mm -hmm. also a monastery in Buenos Aires that helps us make the Holy Land known in, in South America. We have a um, few places in, in, um, in Italy, but our main places are Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, uh, Sy Syria, Lebanon, Cyprus, and Rhodes also. So that's the places where we, we are serving. It's, a, it's an extraordinary footprint. But, uh, you know, when I went on the pilgrimage with you, I expected to see the Franciscans at all the major shrines. But there was much more to the work of the custody than simply um, assisting pilgrims, pilgrims and maintaining a prayerful environment in these, uh, in these locations that are associated with, the, with scriptures and particularly with the life of Christ. Could you describe a little bit of that larger mission, too? Yes, of course, because by being over there, by being the only uh, religious for so many centuries, so we try to take care also of the local people. Uh, in the 17th century, we, we founded the first school in, in the Holy Land. At the time, the Ottoman Empire was in control. And for the Ottomans, the, most, uh, the more the people were ignorant, the easiest it was to, uh, the easier it was to control them. So they will build their first school in the 19th century. Us 200 years before, we will build a school in Jerusalem. Uh, today, we, will, we have 18 schools giving uh, instructions to more than 11,000 uh, 11, people uh, from kindergarten to, um, to, to college. And um, we have one of the lowest tuition of the country. Because for us, as Franciscans, it's important that no one would uh, be forbidden to, to, to study because they don't have enough money. Uh, at the same time, these schools, we want to make them a, a place of encounter. So we will have Muslims and Christians studying together. Uh, the classes are in Arabic, so, so only uh, Muslims and Christians are studying. But that's a way to make them know one another because we do believe that a lot of the tensions that take place over there comes from, the, from ignorance, actually from the fact that uh, they have prejudices and, and they don't know one another. When we put them together, we, uh, they find out that, okay, the other one is not so different than I am. And uh, most of the people over there, whether they are Jews, Muslims, or, or Christian, the only thing they want is, okay, go to their work, take care of their family, uh, have a simple, normal life. That's what most of the people want. And so among other things that we do, we founded, uh, in 1995, a music school, uh, as Lila mentioned that I, I was uh, in charge of the music school a few years ago, that allows us, because music is a universal language, so it allows us to put together uh, Jews, Muslims, and Christians. And there are very beautiful things that are going from that, coming from that school. We have more than 220 students today uh, teaching 12 instruments, and we even have the BA degree in music in that school. 
uh, given to us by the Ministry of Education of Italy. So recognize all over Europe. So other things that we try to do too uh, is to um, help people to live in the Holy Land, help, help the Christian to stay over there. We, would, we don't, don't want the Holy Land to be a, a museum for people coming from, from, from abroad. We want to have a living community inside, uh, inside the Holy Land. And this is not uh, an easy task. In 1948, at the formation of the State of Israel, about 25% of the population, percent of the population was Christian. Today, because of the conflict, and I don't want to accuse one side or the other, but the fact that there are tensions, the fact that there is a conflict, Christians in Israel are 1.4%. In Palestine, it's less than 1%. And so to help them to stay, we have uh, around 630 apartments. A uh, big part of them, more than 400, are in the old city of Jerusalem, and it forms what we call the Christian quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. And then we built houses for uh, young families to help them to start in their lives in other cities like Beth Fajay, Beth Lam, uh, Beth Anina. And, um, and that's a service that, that, that we do too. We are involved, of course, in the dialogue with, um, with the Muslims, with the Jews, with the Orthodox. Uh, we try to build bridges instead of walls over there. Uh, and there are many beautiful things that are coming from that too. Um, we have, as among other activities, uh, we try also to help people to start small uh, businesses uh, so that they, they can live from, from, from what they have. We do it especially right now in, in Syria, where all the economy was destroyed. So we help people rebuild their houses. We help people uh, taking care, um, by trying to, to, to I mean, uh, make the economy run. And we also founded the center, which is um, helping to help the kids, because you have to understand that in Syria right now, there is no kid under 10 years old that knows what it means to live without war. And so we have a center with a team of psychologists that try through sports, to drama, through hearts, to um, help the kids go, uh, I mean, cope and, and, and go over some of the traumas that they, they, they got from the war. Um, we also give a lot of jobs. We have uh, 1,200 employees in the old event. And honestly, we wouldn't need all these employees and that's a way for us to help the local people, to help our, our Christians, um, because it's much better for a person. It gives them, them more dignity to have a salary and come back home with their salary than to give them uh, uh, just goodwill and, and uh, help them survive without working. I mean, when a father of family comes back with the salary, he feels that, okay, I'm taking care of, of those Indeed. that are under my care. Indeed. You know. Um... Uh, Father Wathen, I, I must say one of the great um, spiritual experiences of my life was to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land with the Franciscans. I, I had the opportunity to go with one of your predecessors as guardian and one of your predecessors too, Father Grenier, uh, uh, as, as a U.S. commissary, that's uh, Father Jeremy Harrington. Um, and it was a very, very special experience, but we saw the whole range of works that that uh, Father Grenier just, just described. Um, um, you've seen so many pilgrims uh, go through the Holy Land and seen the experience, what the experience has meant to them. You know, I, my uh, research suggests that, that the experience of pilgrimage in our church goes back at least until the 10th century. So it's been, a, it's been something quite constant in the history of Catholicism uh, with different destinations. But the premier destination has always been the Holy Land to see the sites that are most intimately connected with the life of Christ. So could you tell us about the pilgrim experience as you've seen it? Um, yeah, that would be my area of expertise. Father David Greener gave a nice uh, description, a broad description of our mission in the Holy Land. But my mission or my work in the mission territory was rather narrowly focused primarily due to the fact that I, uh, I don't possess the, the language skills that, that are needed <clears throat> to be engaged in these other ministries in the Holy Land. I, I don't speak Arabic, so 
I can't serve as a pastor in any of our parishes or director of the school or any of the other ministries that are associated with the, the local Arab Christian population. Um, <clears throat> And uh, even my Italian is very weak, so I've, I've never really been in an administration uh, in the Holy Land. <clears throat> so my work has been primarily focused on uh, pilgrimages and thanks to the fact that I speak English, which is a widely spoken language among the people who work in the tourism industry or the pilgrimage ministry. Uh, I was able to work with, uh, during the time that I actually lived there, I lived in the Holy Land for nine years, I was able to work with uh, English speaking groups from uh, a number of different countries serving as their, their guide. Uh, for example, pilgrims from the United States, of course, from Canada, Ireland, England, South Africa, uh, Singapore, Indonesia. Um, and so for me, to be able to accompany uh, these pilgrims, uh, it, it was, a, 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 first of all, it was a very enriching experience because I got to see with my own eyes how, you know, the, these predominantly Catholic Christians, but uh, Christians from other dominant denominations too, that I, I had the privilege to guide, to see their faith, you know, expressed through their prayers, through their hymns, through the way that they reacted when they were visiting these sites, uh, primarily gospel sites. Uh, and so for me, that was a, a very powerful experience. And <clears throat> then when I returned to Washington and was appointed the director of the pilgrimage office, it was an entirely new challenge. Uh, not only was I um, uh, leading pilgrimage groups, but I was trying to find ways to encourage um, the Christians in the United States and elsewhere, thanks to the internet today, to join us on pilgrimage uh, led by the Franciscans of the Holy Land, uh, the people that really know the land inside and out and can give them perhaps insights uh, that might be lacking uh, in other, uh, you know, uh, tourism uh, groups or pilgrimage groups. Um, but yeah, that, that has been my uh, focus, my primary mission for the, the last 20 years, 25 years that I've been engaged in this ministry and hope to be able to continue it if my health allows it. So yes, it's, it's been a real blessing for me. Well, I, pray, I pray God that it, it does, Father. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the Franciscan Monastery, um, which you, you um, have as your residence, has unique kind of association with the work of the, of the, uh, of the custody. And as Father, as Father Grenier said, it has its counterparts in some other countries. Um, we were talking a little bit about that before this began, but, but perhaps you could, you could talk a bit at least about um, how it came to be and uh, because it has sort of a pilgrim focus uh, and what perhaps Father Agrania, you could you could address this as well. What role it now has in supporting and help, helping to accomplish the mystery, the mission of the custody at large? Well, as I, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of our webinar, um, the monastery was founded by um, Father Godfrey Schilling. He was actually a, a German friar. He was born in Germany, but his family moved to, I think it was the Cincinnati, Ohio area. Uh, when he was a young young boy, uh, he joined the Franciscans, and at some point he made his way over to the Holy Land as a missionary. And <clears throat> upon returning, he was uh, appointed uh, the second commissary uh, for the United States. Uh, the first commissary was uh, Father David Grenier. Can you recall his name? Uh, up in New York City, he had an Italian name. Well, anyway, after Father Godfrey, was appointed the, the second commissary. Uh, he had this dream of building a, uh, a seminary near Catholic University, a, a university that had been founded, I think, in 1888. Uh, and so he came to the Washington area and he found this farm on sale. And so in 1897, I think he purchased the farm. And then by 1899, 
the monastery church and friary were ready to be dedicated. <clears throat> and of course, it took a number of years before the church was fully decorated. But part of the, uh, the work of the monastery and the friary and the gardens was to give our visitors um, an idea of what a pilgrimage to the Holy Land might be like. Um, so to that end, he reproduced some of the major shrines uh, that you'll find in the Holy Land here on the grounds in the garden area of the monastery and inside the church and even underneath the church um, where I spoke about the catacombs earlier. And that pilgrims to our site here could have an opportunity to uh, you know, have an experience of the Holy Land. But it was also an opportunity for us to promote our mission to the pilgrims who came here to the monastery to help them to understand what our mission was in the Holy Land and to ask for their help to support us. And uh, that, that continues to be our mission today. And to that end, uh, I think Father David Grenier might want to talk about that. Uh, to that end, we have a number of different ways in which we reach out uh, to the people of the U.S. and elsewhere uh, to assist us in our mission. Uh, Father David, would you like to say a word about the, the campaigns that we run, the Holy Land Review, and some other ways in which we try to promote the, the work of our mission in the Holy Land? Yes, of course, because uh, one of the role of the monastery, of course, is to welcome people for we have celebrations also throughout the week, normal liturgies, but it's also uh, what we call a commissariat of the Holy Land. Uh, there are many commissariats of the Holy Land, we, we said it before, all around the world, uh, about 65 in different countries. And our first task is to take care of the what we call the Good Friday collection. Next week on Good Friday on April 15, in all the parishes of the world, under uh, request of, of the Pope, it's uh, since uh, Pope uh, Paul the Sixth, um, who, who made it uh, compulsory for all the parishes, the money that is received will go to help the Holy Land. So, uh, sixty-five percent of that helps us to maintain all the activities that I mentioned and many others that I didn't have the possibility to mention because that there are just so many needs over there. So uh, we are trying to help all the people that we can in our parishes, in our schools, in the, in the different ministries that we're, we're doing over there, uh, helping people to, to, um, to have surgeries and that kind of stuff, helping the refugees that are displaced by wars, uh, especially the war in Syria. Um, all this is uh, being done thanks to the Good Friday collection. And this is also what helps us to maintain these sanctuaries that are at times about, I mean, 1700 years old. So uh, of course there's always something to fix in these sanctuaries. So this is one of the, our tasks. We try also to make different events to find other fundings in other ways, uh, look for grants. Um, another thing that we do, uh, Father David mentioned it, is uh, the Holy Land Review, because one of our tasks is to help the people to know the Holy Land in the country where we are. So for that, we organize pilgrimages, but also we have this magazine that is published four times a year that gives news of what is going on in the Holy Land and, and um, and help to create a link between the people in the US and the people in the Holy Land. Another thing that uh, is our responsibility here in the US is to look for vocations. I said at the beginning that we have uh, friars over there from all over the world. So that means that we have young men from all over the world that are interested to become a Franciscan. And so those Americans that are interested uh, we will be uh, making the first contact with them through the monastery in Washington, D.C. And that I can uh, inform you that we have one young man from California, Michael, who's in Bethlehem right now. He's starting his formation. We have uh, four others that are discerning and, and hopefully will join too uh, and are feeling to be called to serve in a certain way. And it's very special when uh, the church by being Franciscan in the Holy Land. So 
I want to come back. I want to come back, Father, to your vocations and have you speak a little <laughs> bit about what drew you to the Franciscans of, of the Holy Land. But but uh, but let me just say something about the um, the Holy Land Review. Uh, it, it is a is a wonderful publication. Um, the most recent um, issue that I received um, had a section that showed the Way of the Cross, the Via Crucis, with each one of the stations that, if you were a pilgrim in Jerusalem, you would stop at and pray the Way of the Cross, uh, thought to be the, the route of Christ to um, the site of, of of his crucifixion. And it really brought me back to that place in a, in a very, very special way. So it's a publication that I commend you for. You've heard me say this before, and um, I think is, is, a, is a real tribute. Um, one aspect of your mission that you didn't mention is the archeological aspect of it, which is really extraordinary. And the Holy Land Review helps to cover. There's always something new being discovered under the earth of the old city of Jerusalem, it seems to me. And uh, the Franciscans, are a large part of, of that story. Um, but I did want to ask both you and Father Wathen, uh, at a time when vocations um, are not as common as we would all pray they might be, being called to serve our church and, and the Lord as uh, Franciscans of the Holy Land is a very, very special and wonderful calling. Um, both of you have been uh, at Franciscans of the Holy Land for many years. What, what is it that, that moved you in discerning that this would be the way that you would pursue your, your life um, and your journey, your pilgrim journey um, through life to the Lord? Um, David, why don't you go first? No, no, go, go first. That's fine. All right, as a... Uh... As a young man, I never imagined in a thousand years that I would ever become a religious, um, much less a missionary religious in the Holy Land. Uh, I joined the US Navy when I was 18 years old, uh, almost right out of high school, because that's what my dad had done and my uncles, and it just seemed to be the natural thing to do. So I was assigned to a, uh, a guided missile destroyer that uh, had been assigned to do cruises in the Mediterranean for three years. And during those cruises, we would make stops in different Mediterranean ports. And in 19, uh, I think it was 1977, or it might've been 1978, December of 1978, we made a port visit to Haifa, Israel. Well, I was thrilled uh, because, you know, I'd been brought up on the Bible. I'd heard stories of the, the Bible every Sunday at Mass. So for me, this was an exciting uh, place for, for, our, for us to stop and to give me the opportunity to visit. So the, 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 the Liberty was very generous. So I signed up for two day trips uh, from Haifa, one day trip to Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee area, and another day trip to Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem. And I just remember being overwhelmed. I, I, could, I can't remember much of it because, you know, I was just um, enthralled with what I was seeing. And I couldn't believe that I was seeing the land of the Bible. <clears throat> and as chance would have it, or maybe this was the, the work of the Holy Spirit, I don't know. Uh, I met a friar, a uh, young friar, an American friar in formation in Nazareth, just very briefly, because we were moving as a group. And he introduced himself to me and, and spoke to me very briefly. And, you know, that just, it made an impression on me. I thought, well, what is this young American man doing here as a religious? Uh, it, it, I didn't give it a lot of thought, but, but I, Looking back on it now, I, I think that was where maybe the seed was planted because um, after completing my military service, I began to, I went to school for a short while and then I began to think about my, my life. And uh, I guess it was the, the, the light of the Holy Spirit that suddenly shone in my heart, my soul to uh, consider um, the Franciscans of the Holy Land, because I had come across a vocation ad, I think it was in the Our Sunday Visitor, uh, and I thought immediately, I thought, 
uh, maybe this is the same group that 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 uh, young American uh, belongs to that I had met in Nazareth. So I wrote uh, a letter to the vocation director and and the rest of it is history. <laughs> Here I am today. Oh, God, God bless you, Father. You know, you can always tell the from the ordinary, ordinary, there's nothing ordinary about a Franciscan, but from other members of the Order of Friars Minor, you can tell the members of the Custody of the Holy Land because of the Jerusalem cross that you can see on, 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 on Father David Grenier's uh, um, habit there. Um, oh, Father, um, I, I don't think you served in the Navy, but what, how did you get to uh, the Custody? No, I'm from Canada, so for us, military is not very popular. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, history of uh, military services, so no, I mean, it's it's different. I come from a, a good Christian Catholic family, which is not so common, actually, in my part of Canada. And uh, my grandparents were in the Third Order Franciscans, so the lay Franciscans, secular Franciscans. But as for David, I had never thought during my youth of becoming a, a religious or a priest. That was not something that I was looking into. I had studied some music, I had studied some drama, I uh, was not able to have contracts enough to, to live only from that. So I started to work in uh, a big shrine in Montreal dedicated to St. Joseph, the Oratory St. Joseph. And while I was working over there, uh, I felt the call uh, unexpectedly to become a priest. And um, I decided to discern, I thought that it was a serious choice to make. And it was not clear for me, okay, where to answer that call, because there are many kinds of priests that, 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 I mean, I could have been diocesan, I could have been a monk, I could have been uh, a friar. And in my discernment, uh, many things were bringing me towards the Franciscans. Many other things were bringing me towards the Holy Land. But honestly, at the time, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know if there were some Franciscans in the Holy Land. So I went to see a Franciscan friar that I knew, and I said, but uh, are there Franciscans in the Holy Land? And so he explained to me what I've told you before, that for 800 years, the Franciscans were there. They come from all over the world. They take care of the Holy Shrines. And, and so to see that this idea that looked so unusual uh, was possible for me, it was convincing. And I just decided to trust what I, I was feeling in prayer. And, um, and I never regretted it since then. Well. Oh. We're, we all of us must be very thankful to the Lord for your vocations and those of all the other friars, your brothers uh, in the custody. Uh, you, you mentioned um, um, the importance of the Good Friday collection and, and uh, um, I know that, that the custody has, has, uh, has had some challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has impacted not only the collections worldwide, on Good Fridays, but also the pace of pilgrimage uh, to the Holy Land, which is an important source of revenues as well. Could you talk a little bit about the current challenges that the custody is facing that are unique to this particular moment in its history? Yeah, let's say that the situation, uh, I don't think anyone will be surprised that this situation is very complicated right now. Uh, because as you said, uh, our incomes come, I mean, are mostly coming from the pilgrimages people visiting the Holy Land. Just to give you an idea, um, according to the official statistics of Israel, in 2019, before the pandemic, 4 million people visited the Holy Land, among which 65 persons were Christians. Uh, it went from 4 million to zero uh, from one day to another. And so, and most of our Christians are living, uh, working in, I mean, are working in hotels, restaurants, uh, gift shops, guiding groups, they are linked with the, the pilgrimage industry. So they lost their jobs. Um, they don't have any more money to pay our tuitions. Uh, they don't have, but we keep the kids in schools, of course. And they don't have money to pay the hospital because in Palestine, you don't have any health care. And so we help them with that. So the needs went up, the incomes went down. And also it's the same for the Good Friday collection. In, 2020, uh, most of the churches were closed for Easter. So what we collected was uh, not even um, about a third of what we collect normally. 
Um, and, and so our incomes went down drastically. Our expenses went up. We tried to limit them as much as we can, but the needs of the people went up with the pandemic. So um, we are in a very, very challenging moment uh, right now. If we want to help the people be able to stay in the Holy Land, make sure that there are still some Christian remaining in the Holy Land, in the places where the church was born, um, make sure that they have a place to live, that they have something to eat. And, and, um, and so, yeah, the coming Good Friday collection, uh, I'm inviting you to be generous because that's something that we really need. And also, of course, always to pray for us, that is the most important. And think about going there in pilgrimage. Because as I said, that's the same thing that I said for the jobs. We can give money to the people to pay for their surgery, but if they can work and bring back the money home, because there are pilgrims and they find back their jobs in the restaurants and hotels and all of that, uh, it, 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 it encourages the people much more. Do, do you ever spend a moment thinking about what your, your holy founder, St. Francis, would make of the work that you do and the world that we live in. I'm afraid in some ways he'd find it very puzzling. I think in other ways he would find the work that you do in particular extraordinarily satisfying. That's a, that's a good question. I mean, we will have to ask him <laughs> when we'll be with him in heaven. I mean, we're, we're trying our best to follow his example. There is something that uh, San Francis insisted to put in our rule. Our rule is very simple. Just to give you an example, the Benedictine rule has more or less 76 uh, chapters. Us, we have only 12. But one of the chapters is about the Franciscans that are living among people of other faiths. And he says that the first thing that we should do is to live as good Christians and to preach by your example to show them what it means to be a good Christian. And he adds, and if the Holy Spirit inspires you, you can also preach with words. Um, but, uh, and so we, we try to, to be good examples, uh, to do some good over there. Uh, there's unfortunately so many opportunities to do so. Um, so, so that's how we try to follow the examples of our, the example of our founder. Well, Francis knew the truth of the old saying that actions speak louder than words, right? Yeah. You know, one um, of the great charisms of St. Francis was his love for the natural world. Uh, he took great delight in all of creation. Um, in fact, I, I don't know of a, of a saint of our church who is known uh, more than Francis for that. And uh, one aspect, uh, Father Wathen of the monastery is, uh, is so Franciscan, I think, that it impresses everyone. Uh, uh, your wonderful garden guild and your, and your league of apiarists. Now, I hope everyone on the, on the call knows what an apiarist is. I'm sure you do. But maybe you could talk a little bit about the garden guild uh, and, and your beekeepers. Uh, yeah, our, our garden guild was founded, I think, some 20, 25 years ago or so. And initially, they were founded just to help us to maintain the front gardens, you know, the, the roses primarily. But um, over time, they began to expand their work, their mission, uh, and decided that because we had all of this undeveloped land here in Washington, D.C., that we should do something with it. And so with an increase in the number of volunteers that they they have now in the, uh, Fran uh, the Franciscan Monastery Garden Guild, they are able to cultivate, I, I, do, I don't really know how many acres of land it is, but I, I do know that the president of the Garden Guild told me that they were able to give away uh, about 14,000 pounds of produce last year. And uh, this produce is given to various uh, soup kitchens, uh, various uh, parishes that operate, uh, you know, dining facilities for the poor and the homeless. Um, DC Central Kitchen, for example, uh, to some of the, the various sisters communities in the Washington DC area that help to feed the poor. Um, so, and, and they continue to expand the area because there's still more undeveloped land. 
And, and so with each passing year, it seems like more and more of the land is, is being put under cultivation. And in addition to that, we have uh, beekeepers who maintain, uh, I'm not sure how many hives, but I did hear a couple of years ago that they had reached uh, almost a million bees um, on the property. Um, and of course they harvest some of the honey, not all of it, the bees need to keep some of it. And when they do harvest it, they sell some of it for the support of the garden guild. Um, they give some to the monastery here. So we are beneficiaries of these busy bees here on the Franciscan monastery grounds. And <clears throat> yeah, they, they have uh, done a, a great deal of good work. And I, I think uh, it has helped to enhance the, the image, the public image of the Franciscan monastery that we are trying to do something with these resources that have been given to us and not just to let them lie there, you know, not being put to use. So we're grateful for the, the work of the Garden Guild and uh, one of their major fundraising uh, efforts is going to be taking place at the end of this month, April 30th and May 1st. It's their um, plant and herb sale, which uh, in the past they've always held it once a year, but it's now been three years since their last plant and herb sale. So we're, we're looking forward to a good turnout for that. And we hope the Garden Guild benefits from this greatly this year. That will help them to further their mission. For those who are wondering, I, I just have to observe that uh, if you know the area around Catholic University today, you would wonder how is it that the Franciscans got such a large property that they can actually have this agricultural enterprise. Well, Brookland, when the Franciscans settled there, uh, was really just complete rural territory. Uh, none of what we now know as the Catholic University um, environment, and that's not just the university, but it's all the orders and Trinity University and others existed. And so it, what is the footprint of the monastery today is actually a small part of what was the footprint of the monastery at its inception, but it's still quite a piece of property and very, very productive. And um, I, I commend you, Father, uh, for that. I wanted to add that because it, it's, it's a way of encouraging everyone who may hear um, this, uh, um, this webinar um, to make sure the next time they are in Washington, um, they, uh, they make a point of coming to visit the monastery. It is not to be missed. It is truly one of the, one of the treasures of of the capital city here. And I also wanna underscore what Father David Grenier said, um, uh, please be generous with the Good Friday collection uh, this year and every year, frankly, keeping in mind the important work that the Franciscans are doing in the Holy Land. Um, and go on a pilgrimage, you will never regret it. It will be something that will stay with you for the rest of your life. So, Zella, do we have any questions from our audience? Actually, um, we had a question about the pilgrimages, and since you're talking, I thought I'd interrupt. Um, uh, the, the question is, I know that they're coming back, right? Because I, I got a notice from my church that there's a pilgrimage in October, and, uh, I, and the question from the audience was, is it safe right now to go, you know, over there? And from I was a COVID wondering, perspective? COVID and maybe Whatever political, else. I don't know what they meant, but... Yeah, well, that's my understanding is that it's quite safe to travel there. Um, you know, from a security standpoint, the pilgrims that I have accompanied down through the years to, through the Holy Land, many of them have expressed to me their surprise at how safe they felt when they were in the Holy Land. Uh, the, you know, the, the kind of crime rate that we have in some of our U.S. metropolitan areas, unfortunately, is, is much higher than it should be. But in Israel, it's, it's far lower, far lower. It's much safer to walk the, the streets of the cities in the Holy Land uh, and, and Palestine and Israel, very safe to walk the streets. And, and this is something that su surprises many of the pilgrims and they go over there and they always, you know, the media is always uh, uh, focusing on, you know, terrorist acts and potential wars breaking out and things of that nature. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's, it's a very safe place to travel. Um, in terms of the 
COVID uh, in terms of the pandemic. Um, I think is the state of Israel is being cautious. Uh, they do require for visitors to do a PCR test before they leave their home com country. And they do still require, as far as I know, they still require a PCR test upon arrival in Tel Aviv, but it, it's something that's done very quickly. And then once the negative results comes back, then the pilgrimage group is free to travel throughout the country. So yeah, I, I, uh, I've read now that there have been many groups, uh, especially a lot of American groups that have already visited the Holy Land since Israel opened its borders once again. And, and I see uh, a lot of uh, ads uh, from various travel agencies, um, you know, promoting pilgrimages to the Holy Land. So yeah, I think it's making a comeback, but in terms of our pilgrimage office, uh, it's still very limited. Uh, we haven't recovered. We haven't anywhere near recovered. We have a couple of pilgrimages going next month, but uh, it's not looking so good for the summer. Uh, maybe the fall will pick up. We're not really sure. I'm hopeful that, that it will pick up in the fall. But I think, you know, people need to feel a little bit safer uh, traveling before these numbers will pick up to what they were before the pandemic began. You know, Father, putting COVID aside, um, I remember asking that question about security with respect to my own pilgrimage. And the answer that I got was twofold. One, we have such a presence on the ground. If there was any reason for concern, we would be aware of it and we would address it to, for the safety of our pilgrims. The other thing was that I guess since Francis walked across the Muslim lines with a song on his lips in that characteristic Franciscan habit, you guys in your brown habits have been so well known over there. Everybody is familiar with the Franciscans and you are in a sense, friend to all the world in the Middle East. So I think that's also a, a very characteristic aspect of the presence of the friars in the Middle East and all of that. Um, we have one last question, I think, and then we'll, we'll close this up. Um, I think this is for uh, Father Grenier because you were talking about the businesses that people started. And, and the question was, what kind of businesses with your help have people started and do you teach them the necessary skills for them to be successful? Yeah, there are, I mean, very simple. For example, right now in Lebanon, uh, you probably know that in Lebanon uh, there's a big economical crisis. We have a community of friar living in Dermimas, a parish priest over there, and he's trying to to um, to make a, a place to to make bread for the village. That's I mean simple things like this because they don't have any place to I mean where they can go to to buy bread. Um, we have uh, some other places where they they start in uh, I mean depends depends of the skills that they have also, but in some other places people learn uh, to do pastries. And they 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 open the bakery, uh, a small restaurant. Uh, there's different types of uh, of businesses. Uh, in other places, we we do have many collaborators from other countries. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, experts of pizza from Italy that will go and teach uh, young people over there to make pizza. You would have in Bethlehem. Uh, we do have uh, Bethlehem has a long history of making things in mother of pearl. So that's typic, typical, um, kind of very, very specific kind of, uh, uh, of uh, art craft. And so we teach uh, people in the schools that come to our center and learn how to do that. I mean, this traditional art that, uh, that was very, very famous. And I mean, Bethlehem was very famous for that kind of art. That, that these are the kind of things that we do. Oh, that's wonderful. I wouldn't mind. Um going to one of those pastry shops, I'm sure a bit <laughs> delicious. Well, um, this was a wonderful panel. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful discussion and all the great work you guys do. Uh, there's gonna be a quick audience survey uh, when, when folks exit the webinar. Uh, please take, it's very quick, it's two minutes, or not even two minutes, so feel free to, to give us some feedback for future webinars. Thank you for joining us. And please be healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.